Good to be with you this morning. Good to be with you here, with here, whichever. Uh, we're continuing our series in Abraham, the life of Abraham. Uh, we've had a number of people preach through different passages in Abraham's life, and we'll be looking today at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and 19. Yes, I know, a, a light, fluffy, fun-feeling sermon, I'm sure. Um, I thought it was... Maybe I should dismiss the children for this. <laughs> yes, so what's it called? Super Sunday for those who are five to eight or feel like it. Maybe you have heard the topic and thought, yeah, <clears throat> I think I'll check out Super Sunday. Uh, for those who want to go, now's the time to go check out Super Sunday. Uh, but we'll be looking at Genesis 18 and 19. I thought Bob wasn't going to be here. I thought it was convenient that he picked today to not preach, but he made it back maybe just to watch how it might turn out. Um, he was away at an event this weekend, I still do, in Chicago, a big arena of conference for family life, and we were excited to see how that would turn out. Sodom and Gomorrah, it's a familiar story for a lot of us, uh, and there's a lot of different directions you can take it. But here's the exciting part about it, and I think this is the beautiful part of the story of Abraham, is it's a story. I mean, the Bible could have been delivered to us. God's word could have came as just not the Ten Commandments, but the thousands of commandments you need to follow. And that was it. Just a list. And you could go through and pick whatever it is you're doing wrong and find it and do it right. But, but that's not what came to us. There's certainly that, but there's thousands of stories that you can look to and see. Here's people who do it right. Here's people who do it wrong. And story is a powerful teacher. I read recently that, that most people these days no longer go to the movies for entertainment, but to learn how to live. They're looking for direction in life. How do I live? And story is a powerful teacher. I read that Ronald Reagan's two favorite books were Witness by Whitaker Chambers, which is the story of a guy's involvement in communist spy activities in the U.S. Obviously, that influenced who he became. The other he read as a boy. And it was called That Printer of Udell's. And it's a story about a man of honor and integrity and the way he lived his life. And he said, I closed the cover on that book and I set it down. As a young boy, I remember thinking, all of my life, I want to live my life to try to be like that guy. And it marked him. All through his life, he kept thinking back to that book and that man he wanted to be like because he read that story as a young man. So stories are powerful teachers for good and for ill. And Sodom and Gomorrah is an interesting story. And when it comes to this story today, again, there's a lot of different directions we could go with it. We could spend a lot of time unpacking how it relates to some of the cultural issues we're facing today. But where I want to just narrow in and focus in on is, is what does this tell us about Abraham? I mean, we're studying Abraham's life. Let's study the flow of this story in the context of his life. And let's look at how it relates to what God's teaching us about Abraham. So we'll spend about half our time today looking at the story and talking about it, and then the rest of the time talking about what we learned from it and how it relates to Abraham and how it relates to us today. So let's turn to the passage, and to set it up to help us get our bearings, I'm going to read the first few verses prior to what we'll cover today. And this is in Genesis 18, verses 13 through 15. This takes us back to where... Bob ended last week when he was talking about the promise, uh, the fulfillment of the promise. Verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. For she was afraid, and he said, no, but you did laugh. All right, so here's the context. Uh, we're coming into our section just as a reminder that the Lord had visited them and told them, this promise you've been waiting for will be fulfilled in about a year from now. And of course they laugh. I mean, it seems absurd. But the more embarrassing part here is that he calls them out for it. Now, 
I've spent some time around some important people. There's a lot of people you could list off, uh, none that would probably be too impressive. Uh, one, one moment, I think, where I probably felt like I really need to have my A game on at the highest level is when we had lunch once with Al Mohler, who's the president of Southern Seminary. And I was there with Bob and a couple of other guys. And I like to read a lot and probably read more than most. But next to Al Mohler, I'm like a toddler flipping through board books, really. I mean, he consumes books like a college student's with Red Bulls. It's just knocking them back one after another. And so I'm thinking, this guy is one guy little chance of impressing, but let me at least not make a fool of myself. I can imagine nothing more terrifying than him turning to me, fixing his gaze upon me and saying, why are you laughing at me? I mean, that would be <laughs> pretty difficult to endure. And that's Al Mohler, who is not the Lord. Maybe in some circles they think he's a close second, but he's not. And so I can't imagine how awkward that situation must have been for them. Why are you laughing? Don't you trust? Don't you believe? But here's the other critical part of this, is not just that he called him out for laughing, but that he's given them a timeline. This promise has been setting in their hearts for decades, and he says to them, it's time. It, it's coming. And I remember when I started college, I thought, I can't imagine ever being finished with this. As a freshman in college, it was so green, everything was so new, and a friend of mine introduced me to a guy who was in his master's program, where I, where I was headed, in the same field. And I met this guy, and I thought, I can't imagine being that old. <laughs> it just seemed so far away. But when I got in that final year, you could taste it. You could feel it's coming. We're about done. It has seemed like forever to get here. And now they can taste the promise. In about a year, it's coming. And so we have a rebuke, but right next to it, we have the promise of a promise. It's coming. Now's the time. And so this is setting up where we're headed. And try to imagine, just try to imagine this as a movie scene. He, he's, the last thing he says to Sarah is, no, you did laugh. And then he turns and he looks off towards Sodom. And he begins to think, now what do we have to do here? And this is where we start today in our passage. He has rebuked Sarah in the midst of the promise. And he turns and he looks at Sodom. And it's, let's read in verse 16 through 21. Then the men set out from there and they looked down towards Sodom. Abraham went righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry of Sodom, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So he turns his gaze to Sodom in the midst of Abraham, in the midst of Sarah, and he says, I've got business to take care of there. That's where I'm headed. And he also says, I'm going to let Abraham in on this plan. Now, he certainly didn't have to do that, and I wondered why. Why would he bring Abraham into his business here? Some commentators, and even Second Peter, which we'll look at later, say he's really, uh, we'll, we'll often compare this story to that of Noah. Because you have God going to a wicked place, bringing judgment on people, but yet calling to the righteous and bringing them into his judgment to rescue those who are righteous. And so he says to Abraham, here's what I'm going to do. Here's where I'm about to go. And here's how Abraham responds. Let's look at verses 22 through 33. And this is a familiar section, but it's good to just read through it again. So the men turned from there and went to Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare is the wicked. Far be that from you. 
Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak, suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So we have this familiar interaction, this haggling occurring between Abraham and God. Is there 50? Is it 45, 30, 20, 10? And we have to wonder, why is Abraham so passionate about saving Sodom? What is the burden connected to Sodom that stirs him to want to get into this haggling with God. We may recall a few weeks ago, Bob walked us through the story of Abraham going to war. And the reason he went to war was not to rescue Sodom, but it was to rescue Lot, his nephew, his, in some ways his adopted son. He was going to rescue someone who was caught up in a bad situation and someone who, in many ways, was righteous in that situation. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But it, I think what's happening here is Abraham is begging for Lot's life. He's saying, I know you're going to Sodom and I know Lot is there. Spare him, please. Spare his family. Please care for them in the midst of the judgment you are bringing down. Now, for me, this begged the question, why was Lot in Sodom? I mean, we know that he separated from Abraham because they had too many people. They couldn't coexist. And then it says he put his tent near Sodom. And we'll see here in a minute that now he's sitting at the gates of Sodom. Why Sodom? Why is he there? Why does he continue to linger there? He's been rescued once. Why go back? My take on this, and it's a bit of speculation, but I'll show you where I, I'm taking it from, is I think that Lot, probably deep in his heart, had a deep burden for the people of Sodom. I mean, we've all known people in places that we've thought, no chance God shows up there and does anything. Sometimes you may think that of yourself, even. And I think Lot had a deep burden for these people. And to unpack this, before you guffaw out loud, turn to 2 Peter 2, 6-8. through 8. 2 Peter's near the end of the New Testament. Chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. We'll come back to Genesis, but I just want to give us some context, some more information on Lot, because there's not a ton said about him in the Bible. But here's what it says in chapter 2. First, it talks about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. If he rescued righteous Lot, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So we see right here in 2 Peter, not only was he righteous in some connected to Abraham kind of way, but his soul was tormented daily over what he saw in Sodom. Now, you're either staying in Sodom because you like what you see and you want to be involved, but if you're tormented, I mean, I think you're staying there because you have hope that maybe God will move, maybe God will use me here to bring about change. Now, this could be troubling because of what we know about Lot, right? I mean, we know he stayed in Sodom. We know it affected him and his family. Uh, we know that 
it appears he took the better land from Abraham, so you wonder a little bit about his character. And uh, we know that he offers up his daughters in a moment of crisis to protect other people. I mean, can you imagine anything less manly if tomorrow you heard in the news that tonight some men came and beat on my door threatening my life and I shoved Caroline out the door to them? Few things could be less manly on this earth. So, and this doesn't even get into what he happens with his daughters after Sodom and Gomorrah. We're not even going there. And yet he's called righteous. I keep a file at home of stories of, of moral failures of key Christian leaders, and it's largely to remind me, look, you're not above any sin that's out there. You daily need the gospel to renew your heart and mind. But I've never read a story like what Lot and his daughters did in any of the news clippings I have in my file. And yet, God calls him righteous. Extra-biblical Jewish literature refers to him as righteous. Quite often. <clears throat> so I think what happened is we have a bit of God's heart at play here. Like in Ezekiel where he says, I don't wish for any of the wicked to die, but for all of them to be spared. And so Lot possibly is saying, I'm going here, I'm going to linger, and maybe God will work. Maybe he'll do something. There's a, uh, there's a certain rock star that a friend of mine and I in Kentucky, we've been praying for for about 10 years now. And we continue to pray for him. And by all accounts, many people would think it's insane because his lifestyle shows that God's not really on his radar screen, except in some weird God in America connection kind of way. But we continue to pray for him, and we'll see glimpses of hope. We'll see that he went to church in the news, or we'll see that some of his lyrics point toward faith issues. And we'll just think, what, you know, what, what might God be doing here? Let's keep praying. Part of that is because of the story of Kerry Livgren, which he was the uh, key band member with the band Kansas, which some of you will remember, some of you may not. But two famous songs by them, Dust in the Wind, uh, the other is Carry On My Wayward Son. And if you've listened to those songs, and I'll not have you sing here. I'm not Bob. I'll not try to lead that. <laughs> but there's a great deal of spiritual searching occurring in those songs, a, a tremendous amount. And he's writing those songs, and he's wrestling with, what is my purpose in life? What's going on in this world? And there comes a point where he's up on stage playing, and they're playing these songs, and he feels just this overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit. And that night, he goes back to his room, and he surrenders his life to Christ. And it radically changed the direction of his life. And he comes to find out later that there had been a number of people praying over him in the concert that night and in separate places, in, in meeting rooms, in different parts of the city, praying intently for him, pouring over him in prayer. You never know what's going on behind the scenes in someone's life. You never know how God might be stirring. And I think even Lot in this case is saying, who knows? Now, we don't know that fully. That's a bit of speculation. But why else would he be there? Why else would he be hanging around and still be called righteous in the midst of a difficult situation? Well, we'll learn more about what's happening in Sodom. Lot is in Sodom. He's staying there. And in the point of the story, the men are coming. They're coming to find out, what are we going to do? What is Sodom really like? Let's turn to ver uh, chapter 19, back to Genesis, and let's read what happens. Chapter 19, verse 1. We'll read through verse 11 here to get the next phase of the story. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, bowed himself with his face to the earth, and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house, and they called to Lot. 
Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let, them, let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out, groping for the door. Now, this is definitely where the story gets intense, because there's some crazy stuff happening here. And again, we could spend a lot of time talking about how this relates to some of the sins of our culture today, and what is this trying to say? I will say this about it. It's pretty clear that their intent was to harm in a physically intimate way. That word to know, we want to know these men, has a wide range of meaning, but in the context it's pretty clear. It's the same word used with Adam and Eve. Adam knew his wife. And they're saying, we want to be in a pretty compromising situation with these men. The context also speaks clearly to this because he offers his daughters, daughters who have known no men. So all of this speaks to what's happening in terms of what their intentions were. But what I want to point out, what I found fascinating about this passage and the way the Bible's put together is how this relates so clearly to Judges 19. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in that passage, but there's a story in Judges 19 of a Levite who goes to Gibeah, which is a city of the Benjaminites, and almost the exact situation happens. Almost the exact same story spills out. He comes to a town. He's led away by one of the men there to his house. Men of the city come demanding to know him. Two females are offered in his place. He offers up his daughter and his concubine in his place. But one big difference here is that when he offers his concubine, he comes in the morning to find her dead and abused. And the even probably more stark contrast is the fact that this happened not just in some pagan city of Sodom, but in the nation of Israel. And I think this story in Judges was written so that when someone reads it, in fact, it said nothing like this had ever been seen in Israel before, that someone would read it and go, Sodom. That's just like what happened in Sodom they would immediately recognize. And they would know God is going to act here. He is going to bring judgment. Now, what happens next is even more interesting, I think, in the way this contrasts with the story of Ab Abraham. Because here, with this story, we see God is going to act. Righteous people should be brought to a point of anger and sorrow. And God is going to act. Now, verses 12 through 14, I think, bring out probably the, one of the more interesting contra uh, contrasts of the entire story of Abraham. Let's read in verse 12. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, sons-in-laws, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. Here's the contrast that I think is pretty profound. Lot comes and says to them, God's about to destroy this place. And they take it as a joke. That word, the word for jesting, is the same word, and the only time it's appeared before here in the Bible is the same word for laughter that's used in the story of Abraham and Sarah 
when they heard about the promise. And so the contrast that's set up here, it's pretty stark. You have Abraham and Sarah laughing about a promise, about the unbelievability of it, probably the joy of it, and maybe some crazy combination. I know I've never felt such a mixture of emotion as when watching the birth of one of our children. I mean, it's this overwhelming sadness for the pain being endured, yet this overwhelming delight that it's not me enduring it, <laughs> and that new life is coming into our family. It's just this crazy mix of emotion. I can only imagine that's the kind of laughter that was coming out of Abraham and Sarah. But then you have Lot's sons-in-law hearing that God's judgment is coming, and they take it as a joke. Those are two very different responses. To laugh at God's judgment, I think, speaks to the state of the situation that the city was in. The important question here, I think, for us is, what brings you laughter? Right? What do I laugh at? Do I laugh at the things that are sorrowful to God? It's easy to be numbed to sin in our culture and to find things funny that grieve the heart of God. Michael Easley, who was the former president of Moody Bible Institute, he tells a story of having class with Francis Schaeffer, who was a bit of a Christian philosopher, apologetics teacher, uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, we named, I've mentioned before, we named our son, our last son after him. He had a big influence on us. But he said Schaefer was guest lecture, lecturing in their class at Dallas Seminary. And there came a point where Schaefer was just describing some awkwardness in the cultural dynamic, some difference between believers and unbelievers. And he said most, most of the guys in the class laughed at what it was he said. And they said immediately Schaefer became just very somber and rebuked them for laughing. Why do you laugh? These are people who are disconnected from God and as far as we know are going to spend a life of eternity separated from him and you laugh. And he said it was one of the most memorable situations in his life of realizing I'm far too flippant with the souls of men. What is it that you laugh at? We need to pray that our sensitivity to sin would grow, would increase, that we would not become numb to the sins of our culture. The son-in-law's laugh, and I'm going to summarize up the rest of this. Lot is rescued. The town is destroyed. His wife and two daughters are brought out. The wife turns back. She turns into a pillar of salt. They're taken to another town in Zoar. But then it says this at the end of our section in verse 29. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. And so this brings us back to Abraham. We've been talking about Lot, Sodom, and Gomorrah. Abraham bookends this story. God brings us back to Abraham in the flow of this story. And so this is the question I posed at the beginning. What does this have to do with Abraham? Why Abraham? All right, I'm going to talk about that a bit. We're going to unpack a few ideas about why this, or what this story has to do specifically with Abraham, how this helps us understand the life of Abraham. And I have three main application points to help us make sense of this. And the first is related to an experience I had a couple of weeks ago. I went to Indiana to visit uh, my family because my grandmother had died. And so I went to the funeral. It was over a weekend. And it really was a great experience. She was 92. She'd been in a nursing home for a year. She lived a great life. She was a great woman. Um, and so it was a, lo a lot of ways it was a celebration. I was there with family members. My brother was in from China. My other brother had just moved into the area, so we got to spend a lot of time together, and it was good. It was a good celebration. But the interesting part of her life is she really lived three distinct lives. Uh, she was married to my grandfather, whom I never met, for about 25 years, and then he died from cancer when my mom was a teenager. 
And then my grandma lived about 25 years single, raising her children. Uh, and then she met the husband she was married to when she passed away, Archie. And they were married about 25 years. Now, most people would be fortunate to have one 25-year marriage in their life, but to have two separate ones separated by 25 years is it's pretty amazing. She really lived three distinct chapters of her life. Now, this is going to get a little tedious, but, but bear with me. The last husband she was married to, Archie, uh, he's 92. He's a bit of a character. He's a cut-up. He's an entertainer. He plays a fiddle in a band called the Back Porch Pickers, still plays in it. They go to the old folks' home, <laughs> which he's older than most there. <laughs> he wrote a book called My First Eight Years. It, he loves to play practical jokes and, and cut up with people. And so you need to know a little bit about him. Uh, he is actually the husband of my grandmother's best friend. So no scandal here. What happened is my, his wife died, my grandmother's best friend died, and then Archie and my grandma married. Okay, so they had a lot of rich background. They knew each other well. So he was married to two women who had been best friends at separate times, obviously. obviously. All right, so that's Archie. Again, he's a bit of a character. The point of all this is we're driving to the graveyard. We're on the way there, and my mom says, we're in the car together, she says, you know, uh, Archie decided to be buried between his two wives. And I thought, that's touching. That really is touching. Because surely he's showing his allegiance to both of them, how much he cared, how much both of them meant in his life. And she said, yeah, he said it was like a rose between two thorns. <laughs> and we all laughed. Because we know, and he knows, and everyone who knows him, it's really the opposite of that. I mean, it's really much more like a thorn between two roses. And when I think of his life, I think of my grandmother's life, I think we can look at it as, again, these three distinct phases, but in many ways it was like a season of pain or like a thorn between two roses, between two seasons of promise. Now, not that there's no pain in marriage, but certainly sharing life together with someone can be richer than the difficult season of single parenting. And so we have this picture of promise on either end of pain the thorn between the two roses. And I think when we think about Abraham's life, Abraham was given great promise. Over and over again, he was given great promises. But yet in the midst of that, endured some terrific pain, some difficult situations. With your adopted son having to rescue him, having to overcome him, possibly being destroyed again, immediately after the promises reaffirmed, we have Lot and this situation with Lot. So here's the point I want to make here, and this is the first main point, that even in the midst of great promises, God allows great difficulties. Even in the midst of great promise in Abraham's life and in your life, there can be tremendous difficulties. If it happened to Abraham, should we be surprised if it happens to us? We shouldn't. It's easy to say. I don't say that flippantly. Because I find myself shocked when I have a flat tire. God, how could you let this happen to me, right? Something as simple, as mundane, as daily, as the minorest of things. Why would my child disobey? How could this happen to me? But even in the midst of great promise, God allows great difficulties. The second is that God is with us. God is in person. He's the same God today that came to Abraham then. When the Lord stood before Abraham, he is just as present with us today, in some ways more so. Right? You have Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where it says, Go, make disciples of all the nations. It's the Great Commission, and he says, I am with you always. I will always be with you. You will never be alone. Or you have Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you or forsake you. Very clear. Or in Ezekiel, it gives the promise, I will put my spirit within you. I will be with you. So no matter what great difficulty you're enduring, I promise I will be there with you. Which helps. 
it really does help to take you through that tremendous pain, whatever experience it might be. And I think it gives great perseverance in the midst of the difficulty. There are a few things, I think, for a child or an adult as the thought of loneliness and isolation. Few things as difficult. I remember being separated from my parents at an amusement park or at the mall. Not last year, I'm talking about when I was little. And feeling great fear, great concern. But he is with you. He is the shepherd. He knows your name. He calls you by name. And he will always be with you. He is with you no matter what you're going through. And then third, the righteous must depend on God. Yes, he cares deeply for you. He will deliver you from judgment. But even if you get to a place where you're bargaining and haggling with him over the souls of loved ones, there comes a point, and there came a point with Abraham where he had to say, I've got no control here. We don't know. In fact, God doesn't give him any promises. He, he gets him down to 10, but then the Lord takes off. Abraham doesn't know what's going to happen. He had to trust that God would handle the situation. So whatever it is that you're praying for, whoever it is that you're praying for, you have to turn that over to God and trust that he'll move. You can't make your husband lead your family spiritually. You can't make your wife serve and respect and love you. You can't make your parent do what you want them to do. Even though there may be some serious manipulation occurring at times, you can't make them. And parents, even though you have a lot of control over your children when they're young, you ultimately have to depend on God's spirit to move in their hearts because he's the one that's going to guide and direct them. And you can't make them submit to God. God has to move in their lives. So whoever it is that you've been praying for, a spouse, a neighbor, a loved one, a family member, a child, a rock star, whoever it is, continue to bring them to God. But here's the beautiful part. You can bring them in faith because he has said, I am with you. And I will be with you. Okay. I think really the beautiful part of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot is this tremendous story of contrast. God is a God of promises. He makes covenants. He keeps them. And even in the very difficult parts of life, the pain, he promises to be there. I am with you. And because he keeps his promises, we can cling to his word. And we can go out in faith and trust that he will move in the lives of those we're praying for. While we were at the funeral, I approached at one point my mom and my dad and my sister-in-law were all together. And as I walked up to them, I noticed they were all wiping tears away from their eyes, which is normal activity at a funeral. But that's the only time I saw any of them cry the entire weekend. Because, again, it was a pretty rich time. It was a good time of family celebration. And so I wondered what had stirred their emotions. Well, I came up. They didn't share at the time. It wasn't appropriate. But later, Mom pulled me aside and she said, You know, the reason why we were crying then when you came up was that your great-uncle Kenny had just come up and talked to us. And he's 83 years old. He still preaches faithfully every week at a Methodist church in central Indiana. And he was doing the, the message for the funeral. And he came up to him and he said, I want you to know that two of the family members that I know you've been praying for for decades, for decades, within the last year came to me and asked me to walk them through the gospel. And they accepted Christ. They submitted their lives to Christ. And so here we were in this funeral in the midst of the pain of the loss of someone that even though we were celebrating their, her life, it was still a loss. I mean, death is not meant to be that way. It was still a loss. But in the midst of that pain and thinking about these elements, that you would just bring before God 
those persons you have been praying for for years and ask him to renew your faith. Ask him to reveal ways maybe that you've given up on them and not walked by faith. And just bring that before him and see what he does. And maybe just even after you've confessed your own sin and spent some time communing with him, maybe just spend some time praying for them in a renewed fashion with renewed hope. So we'll we'll, uh, distribute the elements and then come and uh, as we're ready, come the elements as you're ready.
always like to turn to 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul talks about communion. And it says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now let's stand and I'll pray and we'll give thanks to the Lord that we can celebrate his death on our, half, our behalf together. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we have you, that in the midst of whatever difficulty we're facing, we can completely trust and depend on you. Lord, help us to do that this week, to walk by faith, to trust that you'll move in the lives of people who we have been praying for for years, that you would open new doors, that you would give us the courage to take steps of faith. But in the midst of that, that we would completely depend on you. We love you. We thank you for this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Mm-hmm.